Jim. Extra special, Jim. Here you are, sir. Oh, thanks. Then it's a burn back. That is so. Oh, would you mind a moment, sir? Is this your first trip to England, Senator? That is so. Have you any special purpose for your visit? No, sir. My visit's purely exploratory. While here, I hope to have the opportunity of observing as many aspects as possible of the British way of life. I shall study closely the present crisis in the Stirling area. I tell you, England's finished. She hasn't got a ruddy chance. Thanks. Thanks, sir. For England, England may collapse today. The crisis? Well. Well, I don't know. I still think England got a sort of a chance. Oh, thank heaven you at least have not been bitten by this bug of defeatism. I beg your pardon, sir? You said you still think England has a chance. Oh. Uh, well, if it doesn't rain, I think we'll pull through. Ah, you mean the harvest? No, sir, I mean the oval wicket with 560-odd runs to make in the first innings. But if those off spinners find it... Be so good, sir, as to inform me what in blazes you're talking about. Cricket, Governor. The final test. England versus Australia at the oval. Cricket? Now, that is illuminating. I've heard these stories about the passionate excitement cricket arouses over here, but I never did realize that it could drive a grave financial crisis off the national headlines. Well, you see, sir, since the war, we've had quite a few of these financial crises. One a year on average, and we only get the Aussies over here once in four. Perhaps that's what it is. But of course, a war, I grant you, it's different. <laughs> but a crisis. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Where to, sir? The cricket game. Oh, you mean the Oval. <laughs> please. Good morning. Good morning. Going to be an exciting day? I hope not. Hmm? All I want is to see the boys piling up the runs quietly and not getting out. I don't want any excitement, thanks. Pardon me, sir, but as a stranger in these parts, may I ask a question? Go ahead. This, I gather, is the fourth day of this particular game. I also gather that during the past few weeks, there have been four other games, each of five days, between these same teams. Correct. I also gather that this particular game cannot possibly decide anything, whichever team wins. That's right. It is also, I'm told, very possible that neither side will, in fact, win this game. Well, let's hope so. Now, looking around this field, I'd say at a rough estimate, there are 30,000 people here. About that. Now, your hope that there'll be no excitement is, you would say, a fairly general view among all these spectators? Oh, of course, if they're English. I see. Yes, I see. Well, what was your question? There's plainly no point in asking it. Perhaps you'd be kind enough to uh, tell me something about the state of the game. Well, on Thursday and Friday, the Australians batted. And they made that score you see over there. 563 runs for seven wickets declared. Is it important that I should know what declared means? No. Well, on Saturday, we had a spot of rain, so there was only about ten minutes play. And the crowd all got rain checks. Oh, Lord, no. There's no guarantee of play. Look on your ticket. It's very clearly marked. Well, in those ten minutes, Hutton and Washbrook, the English opening pair, made seven runs from their wickets. So in the next two days, it's up to England to try and avoid getting beaten. I see. Couldn't they go further and try and win? Oh, good Lord, no. There's no hope of that. Oh, by Jove, there's something happening. What? Well, they're taking the rain covers off. Yes. That certainly is something. You mean they may actually be going to play? Well, if it doesn't rain in the next half hour. 
Of course, it might rain, and this would wash clay out altogether. That'd be fine. You don't, I uh, gather, then feel completely confident of your player's skill. Well, we got some good opening batting. That's our weak spot there, number five. Five. S. Palmer. <laughs> Old Sam Palmer. He used to be good. He's just about had it now. Who are you looking for, Sam? My youngster and his auntie, they're not there yet. Oh, you're Reggie. I thought he was away to school camp. No, he got back last night. Listen, Frank, if Cyril or I go early, I don't want to see any square cutting off the fast bowlers. No. At any rate, not at the start. And if they bounce them, be careful. Don't try and hit them for six. Okay, you're the boss. Nervous as a kitten, isn't he? Well, you can't blame him, can you? How did you feel your first test? Like him, I suppose. Didn't know whether it was Christmas or Easter. <laughs> Have a word to the lad, Sam. Right, Skipper. How's your Reggie getting on? Oh, wonderful. Really wonderful. His last report said that I ought to send him for a scholarship to Oxford. I meant his cricket. Oh. Oh, well, he can bowl a bit, you know, and he does make a few runs now and then for his... Well, it's his school's third eleven he plays for. Still, I can't say, mind you, after what I've seen, that he's likely to be a... Another uh, Sam Palmer. Well, we can't expect everything, can we? He's keen, Skipper, mind you. Keen as mustard, he is. A gloomy night. Turgid night. Umbrous night. Umbrous night. Ebonite. Reggie, you still here? I told you to go to the Oval and I'd meet you up there. Oh, hello, Auntie. What's the time? It's 20 past 11 and you'll be late now. Oh, they probably won't start on time. Oh, yes, they will. It's a lovely sunny day outside. Well, that doesn't mean they'll start on time, Auntie. The wicket's probably drenched. I don't know anything about that, but your dad's paid a lot of money for your seat and I'm not having you wasting it. What have you been doing, anyway? Oh. Well, I'll just go and put my new hat on. Are you ready? Yes. Well, it doesn't look like it to me. What about your hair? Oh, Auntie, who's going to worry about my hair at a beastly cricket match? Beastly cricket match? I'll thank you, Reggie Palmer, to remember that you're the son of a very famous cricketer who's playing in probably his last test match ever. And it's up to you to say the least of it, to show him enough respect not to sit in the expensive reserve seats at the Oval looking like a dervish. Now, you go up to your room this minute and comb your hair. Phoebus has fled, and ever night has locked the shutters of my heart. Locked the shutters of my heart. And when Aurora's opal light through open portals, oh no, dash it, the ruddy shutters. Reggie. Well, that's a nice way to comb your hair, I must say. Come here. Auntie. Are you sure you want to go and see the whole day's play? Of course I'm sure. Why? Well, you know you're as bored by cricket as I am. Shh, Reg, you mustn't say that. It's wicked. But you admitted it, Auntie, don't you remember? We were at Lord's that day. You well, said I wasn't myself at Lord's that day. My feet were terrible. Anyway, this is a test match. Well, that's worse. Five ruddy days. Reggie Palmer, how dare you talk like that? This is cricket. Why, it's an institution. It's, it's historical. It's well, it's been going on for hundreds of years. And, well, we're going to the Oval now, and that's flat. Come along. Oh, dear. I was so near finishing it, too. What's so special about it? Well, it's for Alexander Whitehead. You see, when he sent me this photo, he also said that my fragment of despair showed promise. <laughs> Only the last three stands has let down the rest of it. So I'm rewriting it. And the trouble is I have to send it off to him tonight because he's flying to New York on Wednesday. Please, Auntie. All right, Reg. You can finish it. Oh, Auntie, thanks awfully. But mind, as soon as it's done, you'll come up to the Oval. Half an hour or so should be safe. Your dad's not in till third wicket down. Still, I wouldn't put it past those Australian fast bowlers to do hat tricks and things. That reminds me. 
What do you think of this? No, oh, I think it's marvelous. It, it sort of, well, suits your style so well. Yes, I thought so. Thank you, dear. Your dad was funny about it, you know. Oh? Well, he doesn't know the difference between a Paris model and a plastic pixie hood. Very well, then. Half an hour. And mind, if your dad finds out, I don't know a thing about it. Don't worry, I'll read up the papers. Anything I miss, he won't catch me on. I've often done it before. Oh, Sam, Sid Thompson wants you. Hi. What's weather going to be like, Sid? Proper scorcher. Am I having supper with you tonight? That's right. Half past seven. My reg is back. Fine. And don't you forget to watch out for Roy Wilson dragging his feet today. I don't need you to tell me how to umpire young Sam. <laughs> young Sam? Oh, he used to coach me when I was a Surrey Colt. Still thinks of me as a kid. <laughs> how old are you, Sam? None of your business. Oh, I'm too old to see him in the slips now, anyway. Anything on your mind, Sam? Oh, I'm just wishing I was 20 years younger, that's all. I shouldn't worry. You're just as good as ever you were. Come on, Cyril. Let's get out there. Well, good luck. See you both at lunch. Close. And in a few moments' time, the batsmen ought to be coming out. So I'll just run through the batting order quickly for you. Hutton and Washbrook will open, of course. Then Weller at number... Turn, Gideon. There you go. Talk about jitters. No, well, you'll be all right when you get out there. I was nearly sick just now. You should have been sick. I was, my first test. How many did you make? 106. Oh, gosh, I envy you. Envy me? Well, you've done it all. It's all behind you. Whatever you do out there won't make any difference. They'll just say, good old Sam. Pity he got out, but you can't make runs every time. That's all you know. Did you read Ned Alvian in the record this morning? No. What did he say? All oh, about how that England's been carrying a passenger for the last four tests and how we shouldn't let sentiment blind ourselves to the fact that S. Palmer has just about had it. Oh, you shouldn't listen to those writing baskets. It's the people out there who can't. Looking for Cora? No, my youngster and his aunt. Who married, Sam? No, widower. How did you know about Cora? Why, oh, I've been to the Stag and Hounds, too. And she told me you and she were pals. She didn't tell me about you. Why should she? I've only been there twice. It's funny you're not telling me about meeting you. Mad on cricket like she used. Four to Hutton, then. Makes him seven. England 12. What makes me sick is before the war, you could walk in there and get six for a quid. Now you need a wheel. He moves in fast. He bowls to Washbrook. And Washbrook sends it straight into second slip's hands. Washbrook's out. No ball. No, he's not. It's all right. Disturbing, though. England want a quiet morning. Time and wicket are important as runs. Small scotch corner. But with England 12 for no wicket, then we return light program listeners to the studio. Oh, Lord, I can't take these test matches. They just about kill me. Sorry, dear, what was it you said? Small scotch, please. No, it doesn't make any difference. Doesn't sound as if he's going to stay long. England all out before lunch, if you ask me. You don't want to talk like that, Mr. Crawshaw. That's defeatist talk, that is. Well, I mean, what have we got to come after these two? We've got a lot to come, if you ask me. That'll be two shillings, dear. Well, of course, there's always Dennis. But this new chap, this Frank Weller, this one that's coming in next, I reckon he won't make many runs. Oh? And why do you reckon that? Well, I mean, after all, what do we know about him? Quite enough, I should have thought. Third in the batting averages and 100 blanks you against the Aussies. Ah, but a test match, that's different. It's temperament you wanted a test match. At least that's the way I see it. I expect that's the way we all see it, Mr. Willis, dear. But there's nothing to say he hasn't got temperament till we see, is there? He was in here last Thursday, Cora, did you know? He was in here again Saturday, as it happens. 
Nice looking young chap, don't you think? Oh, well, it depends what you call nice looking, doesn't it? She's blushing. Cora's blushing. I don't know what you mean, I'm sure. Oh, Cora, we thought you had eyes for only one test cricketer. You've gone up in the batting order and down in the age group. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny, I'm sure. All of you. Well, there they are, and about time, too. Could I have these a moment, Sam? Who are you looking for? I'm oh, just a girl I know. Oh, I'm so sorry. Not at all, ma'am. Think nothing of it. What was that applause for? The batter's just hit a high fly off a foul ball. The batsman has just hit a four off a no ball. Oh. Can I have a look, Frank? When did you say you met Cora? Sure, I thought he was out. What did you say? Cora, when did you say you met her? Oh, about a week ago. Can't get over enough telling me anything about it. You're courting, Sam. Courting? Me, with a boy of 17. What's that prove? That I'm too old for those sort of larks. Huh. Well, it's just that I go into the old stag now and then, and Cora and I, well, I'm a sort of uncle to her, if you know what I mean. And she tells me that... Gosh, this is it. Frank, thank you. Frank. Don't try and get off the mark too quick. If you can't see them too well the first couple of overs, just play them back or cover up and watch them go by. Thanks, Evan. Be all right, son. See you at lunch. Good luck, Frank. Let's have one of your best hundreds, Frank. What's it like out there, Cyril? There's nothing in it at all. I played a bad shot. Good luck, Frank. Thanks. The time is 12 o'clock. We are now taking light program listeners back to the Oval for a further report on the day's play. And here at the Oval, England are 40 for one wicket. Ah, they lost a wicket. Washbrook, what did I tell you? Bold Linda, 22. So long. And now here comes young Frank Weller, out to play his first test innings. Brilliant young man with your left hand. Coming, dear. You, you better hurry, Ducky. You're both in, and who knows, he mightn't last so long. Self-possessed if he were walking Frank? around Piccadilly. Might, might be Frank to you, but uh, just a Weller to me. Now here's his first ball from Linda. It lifts outside his off stump, and he flashes at it, and he was lucky not to get a touch on that one. <sighs> Ruddy young Good fool. Keeper. 40 for one. Second ball, he plays forward and he's popped it up just short of short leg, and Corns almost made a catch out of that. No, it's no good, I can't stand well, it. it you can again. listen if you like and let me know what's happened after it's happened. Cool I ever. prefer it that way. Is bad. You know, Fred, I don't think this is such a joke. I really believe our core has gone off the deep end good and proper and about that young comes chap. Over, he bowls, it's a good length ball outside the off Poor old and chap. There he is, Weller, off the mark. A characteristic rolling cover drive off his back foot. Another homer! Hot dog! Could you tell me the right time, please? Why, certainly, ma'am. My gosh, it's only five minutes after twelve. Thanks. This goes on until half past six. Say, don't those guys out there ever get tired standing around for seven hours solid? There's a lunch interval at half past one. Oh, mighty glad to hear it. The time is just two minutes short of half past one. Before the next program, here's a record of a show past That's one. Gosh.
Say, something's happening. Lump. Tell me, is there a quick lunch counter at this stadium? Well, there is a place where you can get sandwiches, I think, but uh, it's not exactly quick. There is a restaurant. Fine. Would you care to join me, ma'am? Well done, Skip. Good chair, Frank. Well done, Skip. Well done, Skip. Frank. Bowling looked good from here. Yes. Frank had a sticky time, didn't he? Well, he's still out there anyway. You'll be right this afternoon, you see. Nice work, young fellow. Have you got over your nerves now? Yes, you'll be hitting them all over the fields this afternoon. Yes, yeah, Frank, I will. Oh, I forgot to ask you, Sam. Are you taking this coaching job at Eastman? No, I've turned it down, Skipper. I thought you liked the idea. Well, I did in a way, yes. It's a good job, mind you. I'm not saying it isn't. I like coaching youngsters and I'd still be with cricket, but we can't always do what we want to do, can we? I don't see why not in this case. Well, look at it this way, Skipper. If Reggie's going to get on and perhaps go to Oxford, he might be meeting some of these young lads from Eton and making friends with them, perhaps. And then if he's got to say who his dad is, well, you see my point, don't you? Not entirely, Sam. I think you forget the world's moved on a bit since you were Reggie's age. Oh, I don't know. Young chaps are much the same today, I'd say, Skipper. Still rather sensitive about their dads having the right sort of job and all that. No, I've bought myself a sports goods business. You're going to be a big businessman, are you? Oh, no, I shan't have much to do with it. I've no head for business, never had. No, it looks as though I'm going to do a lot of gardening for the rest of my life. Sam, I, uh, I'd like to meet you, Reggie. Would you really, Skipper? Well, I'll bring him up to the dressing room at lunchtime tomorrow, if you like. That'd be grand. He'd be really thrilled to meet you. A light laugh on thy lecherous lips. My crushed heart bleeding in thy hand. Gosh, just about perfect. Just about perfect. Lovely talk and no error. Oh, hello, Auntie. Hello, Auntie, indeed. I thought you'd got yourself run over or something. I'm awfully sorry I got stuck again. In fact, I got stuck several times. I quite forgot the time. What is it? Seven o'clock. Oh, Lord, it isn't. You mean it's over? As if you didn't know. Oh, I, I didn't. Honest, I didn't. Well, what happened? Well, what's the close of play, Auntie? Quick, Dad will be back in a second. If you think I'm going to help you lie to your father, my boy, you're very much mistaken. You'll take your medicine from him. Of all the disgraceful things to do. And your dad's last match, too. Did he... did he bat? Well, luckily for you, he didn't. Well, what's the score, Auntie? What's the score? I've got to make sense when he comes in. Oh, please, Auntie, I really didn't know I was doing it, I promise. And I don't want to upset him. You don't either, do you, Auntie? You're a wicked, naughty boy. England made 320 or something for two wickets. All right. Did you bring the paper in? No, I didn't. Oh, Lord, you'll have to tell it to me then. Who made the runs? Oh, Lord, my feet. Who made the runs, Auntie? This new chap, Weller. He made 120. Uh -huh. uh, not out? No, he was out. How? Here, take this. How was he out, Auntie? Oh, he was caught. Where? Silly boy, how do I know where? By that chap who stands right at the bowler, I think. A mid off. Was it a good catch? Well, he caught it. Anything sort of thrilling happen? Thrilling? In a test match? <laughs> Don't think it'll rain tonight, do you, Sid? Shouldn't think so. Wind is from the north. Come in, come in. Shall I tell him I'm ill or something? You'll do no such thing, Reggie Palmer. You'll have supper with your dad and Mr. Thompson and make the best of it. See? You didn't have any lunch, I suppose? No, Auntie. Oh, yes, you did. But that's... You had it with me and an American gentleman in that restaurant across the road. Remember? It was cold meat and salad and a very nasty trifle. And it cost the American gentleman 16 and fourpence, which was just about eight and fourpence too much. Yes, Auntie. Reggie! Are you there, Reg? Oh, Lord. I hope I can make sense. Hello, Dad. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to bat. No, I wasn't. How did you get back so quick? Oh, we caught a bus, all right. Oh, you must have been lucky. When I left, there were still queues a mile long. Oh. Come and meet Sid Thompson. Sid? This is my Reg. Glad to meet you. Yes, he looks like you, Sam. Oh, I can't see it myself. More like his mother, I'd say. Enjoy the game today? Yes, yes, very much. 
What's this, Reg? Oh, just something I wrote this morning before I went to cricket. What's Ebon? Eben. It's ebony, but you can say ebony in poetry. Can you now? <laughs> well, this is quite something. You like to read it, Sid? It's a poem. Uh, no, not me. Not unless it's about cricket. Cricket? Poets don't write about cricket. Come and help me lay the table. Have a drink, Sid. You know where it is? Skipper batted well, didn't he? Yes, so did Weller. Yes, after lunch. No, he wasn't very good before lunch, was he? Nervous as a kitten. Just like me, 24 years ago, practically to the day. Well, you made 100 in your first test match too, didn't you, Dad? That's right. And you'll make 100 tomorrow in your last, I bet. I was in quite a stew when Weller got out like that. If Dennis had gone quick, I wouldn't have fancied going in tonight just before the end. It was a good catch, wasn't it? Good catch? The one Weller got out to at mid-off. Well, if that's what you call a good catch, now I know what's wrong with your fielding. A child of six couldn't have missed it. Besides, it wasn't mid-off, it was mid-on. Oh, yes, that's right, mid-on. Oh, for heaven's sake, Reg. Haven't you learned the difference between mid-off and mid-on yet? Well, it was a bit difficult to see from where we were, you know, Dad. Well, they were good seats. They cost good money. Oh, you're back, dear. That's good. Hello. What was wrong with the seats, Ethel? Nothing was wrong with them. Why? Well, Reg said he couldn't see very well. Oh, well, uh, now you come to mention it. He did have rather a big man sitting in front of him. Well, that shouldn't have made any difference. That stand is tiered. Well, this man was very big. He was almost a giant. Oh, Sam, my feet, they're terrible. What with the heat and the crowds and queuing for that tube for half an hour, I'm fair worn out. You said bus, didn't you, Reg? I meant tube. Who's been giving me the tail, Reg? You or your aunt? Me, Dad. You didn't go? What was the matter? Didn't feel well or something? No, I... I was writing, you see, Dad, and I... Forgot the time. Forgot the time? Well, that's true. When you're writing, I, I can't explain it, but... But you get so worked up and so... Oh, I don't know. What's like being drunk is, I imagine, and... And it's as if... As if there isn't such a thing as time. Do you understand what I mean, Dad? I might have been batting today, you know. Yes, I know. For the last time in a test match. And I wouldn't like you to have missed that, Reg. Even if it was only just the one ball, I wouldn't like you to have missed it. Stupid, I know, but that's the way it is. You coming tomorrow? Oh, yes, of course I am. Well, you're going to miss Frank Weller, then. And we'll have plenty of chance of seeing him in the future. Dad, I, I'm awfully sorry, really, I am. It's all right, Reg. And the next time a thing like this happens, don't tell me any more stories. Makes me think you're scared of me, and I don't like that. I don't like it a bit. Sorry, Dad. Remember that. Aren't you having one? No, I've got to think of tomorrow. This is good, is it, Reg? Well, I think so, Dad. I'm sending it to Alexander Whitehead. Aren't you troubling Mr. Whitehead a bit too much? Well, he's always saying in the papers how he wants to help young poets. Oh, that reminds me. Do you mind if we look at the television tonight? They're doing a one-act play of his, and I do want to see it. Yes, well, I like a good play, especially when it's short. <laughs> Supper's ready. Good evening, Sid. Evening, Ethel. And if Mr. Whitehead does buy that poem of yours for a hundred pounds or so, I'll trouble you for 15 shillings of it, because that's what you owe me for your seat. <laughs> I hope there's enough, Sam. Anyway, you at least had a good lunch, which is more than Reggie and I did. And what did you and Reggie have for lunch? Go on, Reggie. Tell him. Well, go on, silly. Tell. You haven't forgotten, have you? Oh, Auntie. Oh, uh, so you found out, have you? Well, don't blame me for having nothing whatsoever to do with it. <laughs> oh, no, I know, Ethel. I can see that. Find out what? Never you mind. And what was the tale you wanted him to tell me about lunch? Will you be quiet? Fine pair. Conspiracy in my own family. Oh, silly boy. How did you give it away? You did. I did. Well, I like that. You said I well, I was caught by the chap who stood to the right of the bowler. Well, Ethel never could tell a left hand from a right, isn't that so, Ethel? And how's the world been treating you these days? By kind permission of the third programme of the BBC, we are presenting tonight a comedy in one act 
by Alexander Whitehead, entitled Follow the Turtle to My Father's Tomb. The cast is as follows. The part of Godfrey is played by Valentine mm. Dial. All right, then. The part of Antonia. Thank you, Papa Holmes, then. This is Liberty Hall. And before we begin, I would like to warn you that we do not consider this play suitable for children. Oh, good. The scene is limber. The time is now, or perhaps yesterday, or possibly even tomorrow. Limbo? Where's that? Sort of hell. Oh, how nice. Calm. Calm. Who are you? Lucasta. Pastanope. Antonia. What do you want with me? An answer, an, an answer. answer. We await your fateful answer, just as a hinge of fate swings the future like an unhinged brain. Which, Which of us do you love? love? Antonia? Lucasta? Penelope? Which? Ah. Uh. How came I here? I suppose the surgeon's knife slipped somewhere in the neighborhood of my gallbladder, dividing all the gall into three parts, which is now the bright sword of the Archangel Michael, poised over my dead skull like a single blade of the Aurora Borealis. And the swabs which the theater sister littered on the dunes of my belly well. now litter this sky like bellying clouds. And the hiss of the anesthetic is the whisper of an eternal wind in the great conch of God's ear. Oh. Where am I? In hell or in heaven? Heaven is hell and hell, hell is heaven. Hell. Death, just as life is death. That's the 45 bus going past. Nobody's dead but not living. Nobody's alive but not dying. Nobody's anything but nothing. 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 I thought you said this was a comedy. Oh, yes, Auntie, of course it is. Oh. Well, it probably gets more comical later on. The scene now changes to a graveyard in Adrianapolis. I don't think I'll come in, Sam. I'll say good night. All right, Sid. I'm sorry about the play. A bit above our heads, I'm afraid. I can see why they said not for children. <laughs> good night, Sam. Thanks for supper. You're welcome. Good evening, Mr. Palmer. Good evening. Good night. Thank you. Good evening, Sam. Going to beat your own record tomorrow? I hope so. Last orders, ladies and gentlemen, please. Last orders, please. There you are, dear. Thank you. Hello, Sam. Hello. Have another Guinness, dear? No, I've had my two, dear. We'll have this one on the house to celebrate Frank's hundred. Oh, well, I don't mind if I do. <laughs> Here, put a little something in that to take home, will you, dear? You're just in time. Mild and bitter? No, I'm off it tonight. I'll have a lemonade or something. Not on the house, either. Did I love you, or you, or you? Or all three equally? A direct question demands an answer as direct. Say! Stay, stay. And so, as my soul flies rocket pure through that great dome of discovery that men call the sky, and as the scarlet thread of my tangled life is rewound on the remorseless looms of the gods, so do I give you my answer. My answer is... Yes. <laughs> Oh, that was wonderful, Auntie. Yes, dear. Wonderful. Imagine his answer being yes. Oh, I think that man's a genius. Time, please. Good night, Cora. Good night. There you are, dear. Have it on the house. Watch your step, Daisy. Oh, Mr. Arbonne will see me out, won't you, ducks? <laughs> <laughs> Not tonight, Daisy. <laughs> Good night, Cora. Good night. Good night, Mr. Simpson. Good night, dear. Time, gentlemen, please. Not too dear, of course. I didn't know you met Frank Weller. Didn't you? Good night, Cora. Good night, dear. I thought I told you. Didn't you, know? Didn't I? Must have forgotten. Good night, Mr. Ballas. 
Good night, Good Mr. Whitworth. Claire. Come again. Good night, Cora. Good night, Cora. Good night, Tony. See you tomorrow. Good night. Come on, Bill. You're always last. There's a good boy. Cora. I'm afraid you can lock up now. Okay. Hmm? About this chap, Frank Weller. Well, uh, what about him? I shouldn't see too much of him if I were you. Oh, well, why not? You know why not, Cora. You know his reputation with the girls. Well, anyone can get involved in a divorce case. Nothing in that except bad luck. How often have you seen him? Twice. Why? Well, did he... Has he... Well, I mean, did he suggest that... Of course he did. He suggested I should fly to Baghdad with him next Tuesday. Oh, talk sense, Sam Palmer, do. No need to take that tone, Cora. What I'm telling you is for your own good. Not for yours, I presume. I don't know what you mean about that, either. Well, it's a funny thing. You said exactly the same thing about Nat Parsons and Mr. Hardy. Well, it was true of both of them. You know what they were after. Of course I know what they were after. How did you know I didn't want them to get it? Cora. I'd like to know why you think you've got the right to manage my life, Sam Palmer. It's not as if there was... Well, as if there was anything between us. For the last two years, you've just stood at that bar, gooping away and making goat's eyes every night of your blasted life whenever you were in town. And apart from a few kisses under the mistletoe at Christmas and, and some mushy letters that don't say anything more definite than I wish I was back at the old stag again, nothing's happened, nothing at all, nothing. And yet if I so much as look at another man, you talk as if I was tottering on the brink of the bottomless pit or something. Well, I don't know, I'm sure. I'd just like to know what I'm supposed to be doing while you're waiting around there to make up your mind. Put a veil over my face, crack a bottle over the head of the first man who tries to be a bit friendly with me. You behave as if we were married or something. Well, we're not married and we're not all something either. And if you want to know where I'm going next Tuesday after hours, I'm going to the Spotted Dog with Frank Muller. And after that, anywhere else he wants to take me. Perhaps even to the bottomless pit, who knows? And now time was up five minutes ago and I don't need any more help, thank you. And if you don't want to get me into trouble, you better buzz off. Well, I don't know what to say, Cora. I don't know if there's anything to say. Well, I suppose you're right. I'm... I'm nearly old enough to be your father. That's no reason why you should behave like one. That thing you said just now about... that thing about or something... that was a joke, wasn't it? Oh, I gave myself a stitch laughing. I'd like to think it was a joke. I'm a bit old-fashioned, you see, and, well... the girl I asked to... To marry me. You see, I want to be, well, you know, sure about. It's very interesting, I'm sure. I really don't see what your views on marriage have got to do with me. Oh, well. Good night, Cora. Good night. How many runs exactly did Frank Weller make today? 120. I'm going to double that tomorrow. Well, we'll see, won't we? Yes. We'll see. Auntie. Hmm? Do you think I dare ring him up? Ring him up? But they'd never give you his number. Well, I know the number. It was on his letter. But you can't go ringing up famous authors in the middle of the night, lad. But it's not the middle of the night, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind. After all, I only want to tell him how much I enjoyed his play. No one could object to that, or well, I know I wouldn't. And then I could just slip it in about sending him the poem, and... and then I could be sure he'd read it, couldn't I? I don't know, I'm sure. But Henry's only told, I think, only about ninepence. Reg, I'm not at all sure about this. Fool, the one card in the universe that gives them the pack, you have to play it. Well, if you've given me some indication as to what you wanted, instead of sitting there goggling at me... Are you suggesting that I should have cheated, is that it? Well, you usually do. What an absurd idea. Pay no attention to my secretary. Her sense of humour is roughly as acute as Nero's. Partner, may I go out? No! Yes. Damn, answer it, will you, Fanny? You answer it, you're nearer. My secretary. Hello? Yes, this is Alexander Whitehead speaking. Uh, this is Reginald Palmer. Uh, uh, Reginald Palmer. Yes, I, I sent you some poems the other week. 
I just rang up to tell you how much I enjoyed your play, Follow the Turtle to My Father's Tomb. Yes, it, it was on television tonight. This is entirely your fault. I'm in the clutches of a hysterical fan. Oh, thank you so much. No, I'm afraid I didn't see it myself. I was working. Did you know they were televising Turtle tonight? No, were they? You're sacked. You sent me some poems. Oh, yes, yes, of course I remember. Yes, I thought they were excellent. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Whitehead. For heaven's sake, rescue me, Fanny. As a matter of fact, the one you told me to rewrite, I'm sending down to you first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, yes, uh, I'm afraid I missed the last post. Oh, that's splendid. I tell you what I'll do, to be quite sure that I get it, I'll have my secretary, Miss Fanshawe, pick it up herself from the post office on her bicycle. No, no, she won't mind at all. It's only two miles. Not all of it's uphill. Hurry up, Alex. Yes, well, it's most, I must get back to work now. It was most kind of you to call. We must meet sometime. Oh, I'd love to, Mr. Whitehead. Yes, yes, I could come down to Henley any time. Um, how about Wednesday morning? Your plane doesn't leave till 4 p.m., does it? This juvenile delinquent seems to know more about my movements than I do myself. I think I shall engage him as my secretary. Well, I'm afraid Wednesday won't be any good. It'll have to be tomorrow. Alex, what are you doing? I must see him now. If I don't, he'll start a down with Alexander Whitehead Club or something. I should be coshed coming out of the Athenaeum. I'm afraid the evening won't be any good. Better make it the morning. About 11. He's rung off. I think this must be the most awful thing that's ever happened. Well, you can't go, dear, and that's flat. But if I don't, he'll think I'm terribly rude. Ring him up again. Tell him you've made a mistake and you've got another engagement. To go to a cricket match, you would think I was mad. Don't you realize, Auntie, this man is the greatest poet since Shakespeare? I can't insult him just like that. I don't care who he is, dear, or what he is. But, Auntie, I... Hello, Sam. Hello. You all right, dear? Yes, why? I don't know, you look a bit worried. Oh, I'm all right. Well, I'm off to bed, and you better do likewise. A lot depends on tomorrow. Good night, love. Good night, Good night, Reg. Good night, Auntie. Reg. You know Cora, don't you? At the stag, I mean. Oh, yes, yeah, she was here to tea one day. What do you think of her? Oh, I don't know, Dad. She seemed a bit sort of, well, ordinary. Hmm. Which is another way of saying common, I suppose. Well, I... All right, all right. <laughs> Dead. Yes, Dad. Dad. Yes, Rich? I, um, I rang up Alexander Whitehead tonight. Did you? Yes. Yes, he was awfully kind. He, um, asked me to go over to Henley and see him. Did he really? When? Oh, sometime. Dad. Yes, Reg? Oh, doesn't matter. By the way, I want you to go up to the dressing room at the luncheon interval tomorrow. They'll let you through with a note from me. Oh, why, Dad? Sir Hutton wants to meet you. Mr. Hutton? Oh, yes, the English captain. That's a thrill for you, isn't it? Mm, yes, Dad. <laughs> Quite a thrill. Reg? Yes? What would you say if I were to tell you that what, Dad? Oh, it doesn't matter. It'll keep. Good night. Good night, Dad. got your blue on. Makes you look almost human. You telephone that Mr. Whitehead yet? No. Well, it is a bit early. You can do it after breakfast. Morning, I thought. Morning, love. 
Oh. You didn't sleep well, did you? What makes you think that? Well, you don't look as if you did. Well, I did, anyway. You should have taken one of those pills. How can you expect to make runs if you don't get to sleep? Now, stop it, Ethel. Do you mind? Well, I was only saying... I that... know what you were saying, but I said stop it if you don't mind. I don't want to be reminded of what I've got to do today. Well, it's not a dead, I'm sure. Well, I'm glad you've got your new suit on. This is what you could have handed at the door, Reg. The door? Yes, at the pavilion to get up to the dressing room. Oh, yes. Thank you. Dad, I've got to tell you something. Yes, Reg? Last night you said I wasn't to tell you any more stories. You said I wasn't to be scared of you, didn't you, Dad? Yeah. Well, then it's this. I'm not going to the Oval this morning, Dad. I've got to go to Henley. Don't listen to him, Sam. He's talking nonsense. It isn't true. Did you know about this? Well, I knew it was in his mind, but I never thought... How can you go upsetting your dad like that? This morning of all mornings, asking him to let you do something in knows out of the question. I'm not asking him to let me do something, Auntie. I'm telling him I'm going to do something. Oh, you wicked boy. How dare you? Let me handle this, Ethel, if you don't mind. Now, let's get this straight. Why have you got to go to Henley? To see Alexander Whitehead. Oh. Do you remember promising me you'd come to the Oval today? Didn't promise Dad, I only said I would. I only said you would. Do you happen to remember why you said you would, or have you forgotten me telling you it was important to me that you should be there? Today of all days. No, Dad, I hadn't forgotten. I see. Well, there's no more to be said then, is there? Have you got your fare? Yes. Do you know how much it is? Well, yes, I've got enough to get there anyway. How are you proposing to get back? I don't know. I thought I might hitchhike. Or perhaps Mr. Whitehead might... You can give me the change this evening. Thanks, Dad. I think it's the most graceful, wicked, cruel thing I've ever heard. Yesterday was bad enough, but this... All right, Ethel. Off you go, Reg. Go on, catch your train. Dad, uh, I've got to try and explain. I know you think it's terrible of me not to put off Mr. Whitehead and come and see you, Bat. But cricket's been your life, and of course you see it as something awfully important. That's perfectly natural. But one's got to keep some sort of sense of values, Dad. After all, it is only a game, and you can't compare it to... well, to the more serious things of life, like the things Mr. Whitehead stands for. Oh, gosh. I'm making it worse, I suppose. What I mean is, Dad, whatever you think about the game, it, it does resolve itself into banging a bit of red leather about a field with a piece of wood. Then you do it well and I do it badly and I'm sorry. But I don't see why I should have to give up the chance of my life just to go and watch you doing it. Oh, I'm sorry. I've said a lot of things I didn't mean to say. Only they were in my mind, you see. I'll get back from Henley as quick as I can, and I'll go straight to the Oval. I hope I'll be in time to see you back. Thanks for the pound. I'll pay you back. Well, Sam Palmer, how you could just sit there and let him say that, I... Answer that, will you, Ethel? It'll be Sid Thompson. I'm giving him a lift up to the ground. Morning, Ethel. Morning, Sid. What was your Reggie doing, running out of the house like that? He nearly knocked me down. Oh, dreadful things happened. I'm that upset, Sid. Really, I am. Do you know what that wicked boy's gone and done now? He's upset... Ethel, if you're coming with us, you better go up and get ready. All right, dear. Is it going to rain, Sid? About tea time, I'd say. Better take my Mac, then. Trouble? Yes, our Reggie just gave us a piece of his mind, that's all. What about? Cricket. Said it was just banging a bit of red leather around a field with a piece of wood. Hit him for a six? Why not? Oh, because he's right, I suppose. After all, you want to get down to it, that's all it is, isn't it? Sam, are you feeling all right? 
Oh, it's a good game, all right. I'm not saying it isn't. The best in the world, I think, but then I'm good at it. Or at least I used to be. You know, Sid, my father never wanted me to go in for cricket. He wanted me in the building trade, like him. Only shows how wrong he was, doesn't it? Does it? Well, you've made a bit, haven't you? Oh, I've made a bit, all right. Cricket's been good to me, and I'm not complaining, but... The trouble with making a game a profession is that you're at the top too young. The rest of the way is a gentle slide down. <laughs> not so gentle sometimes. Sid, it makes one feel so ruddy useless and old. Well, at least you reached the top, Sam. More than I did. Your name's known to millions. Yes, Sid, and I'm grateful for that, I suppose, but it isn't enough. It isn't nearly enough. A man's got to feel that he's justified himself in this life somehow, and, well, building things is different. What you've built is there when you've done, and you can look at it and say, that's what I've done, and it's solid and useful, and I've served a good purpose doing it. Writing, that's the same, I suppose. What you've written is there on paper, and people can read it and act it. <laughs> Even if a lot of people don't understand it or appreciate it, but... Banging a bit of leather around a field. I'll bang his bit of leather when I see him. No, oh, I didn't only Reg. I've been thinking it a long time. Only I had hoped that Reg wasn't thinking it too. Well, you know how it is with your kid. I don't expect he meant it. Oh, he meant it all right. Oh, well. Sid, I want runs today more than I've ever wanted them before. You'll get them. Only if you're going to be out LBW, don't do it my end, there's a pal. <laughs> now, don't look at my feet. I know I've got the wrong shoes on, but I'm not killing myself for anyone today. That's quite a hat, Ethel. Oh, thanks, Sid. Some people don't like it, you know. Some people think it looks silly. I didn't say it looked silly. I simply said I thought you had it on the wrong way around, that's all. Oh. She'll never forgive me for that, you know, Sid. <laughs> Now, you're not going to let Reg upset you, are you? Reggie, I've forgotten all about him. I don't think. Well, there's my lucky farthing. It always works. Put it in your pocket before you go into bat. Thanks, love. My name is Palmer. I have an appointment with Mr. Whitehead. I think there must be some mistake. I'm his secretary, make all Mr. Whitehead's appointments for him. Oh, but I've come all the way from London, especially. When did you make this appointment? Last night on the telephone. Oh. Oh, yes. I think he told me something about it. Won't you come in, Mr. Palmer? Thank you. What time did Mr. Whitehead say he'd see you? Uh, Eleven o'clock. Was it about anything special? Well, he, uh, he asked me to show him this poem of mine. A poem? I see. Thank you. Well, if you wouldn't mind sitting down, I'll go and see Mr. Whitehead and tell him you're here. The only thing is he's very busy at the moment. It may be just a little bit difficult to disturb him. I shan't be a minute. Surface, Alex. Alex. Did you pinch me? Yes. You're sacked. I can't be. You sacked me last night. I don't remember doing anything so sensible last night. What an idiotic game Canasta is. Did I really lose eight and temperance? Yes. Oh dear, too much sun. Take it away. What about your ode to the sun in the listener last year? <laughs> I hadn't been playing canasta till five in the morning. It's only eleven. I haven't had my eight hours. Fanshawe, you horrible woman. Go away. I'm going to sleep again. You're nothing of the kind. We've got a lot on hand today. Later, dear, later. Besides, Master Palmer is downstairs waiting for you. Who might Master Palmer be, as if anybody cared? The character you invited down to see you last night. I did nothing of the kind. I did. How dare you let me do a thing like that? What else do I pay you for except to stop me inviting beastly little boys to my country retreat? A few other things. Well, cope with him, dear. How? I've developed a very serious illness in the night. 
Which doesn't prevent you flying to America tomorrow. No, only lasts 24 hours. Tropical origin, very rare. He's come all the way from London. And he can go all the way back to London. He'll go when you've seen him and not before. Oh, bother. That was his poem. He wanted you to comment on it. I have commented. Now read it properly and come down and be sweet to the poor boy. Remember, you were his age, once. I very much doubt it. How long will you be? You've got an awful lot of letters to do today. I have to think about three hours. I suddenly remembered. I can't see anyone at all this morning. As for letters, out of the question. Why? I have my poem to write for the New Statesman. Well, you can do that this afternoon. It will take me all day. When are you going to see this boy, then? In the spring. Alex, you've got to see him. I won't have you behaving like this. Do you understand? Very well, then. I shall see him at lunchtime. Do you want him to stay for lunch? Are you absolutely insensible to human suffering? I shall see him for five minutes at 1.30 precisely. I may give him a cocktail. Cocktail? Well, Ginger Pop, then, do go away, dear. How can I enjoy my breakfast with you fluttering around me like a, an expectant vulture? Shoot. Eben Knight. T.S. Eller, Wheeler, Elliot. Oh, it's rather good. Oh. oh, Mr. Palmer, I'm so sorry, I'm afraid there's been a little mistake. Mr. Whitehead is quite sure that the time he arranged with you on the telephone last night was for half past one. Half past one, but he said eleven, he did really. Well, perhaps you misheard him. Oh, gosh, how awful. Look, couldn't he possibly... No, I'm afraid not, he's very busy at the moment. Would you like me to make another appointment for you? Well, how long is he going to be in New York? Well, a long time, I'm afraid. Oh, I... I think I'll stay. The harm's done now, anyway. The harm? Well, you see, I, I shouldn't really be here at all. Where should you be? Oh, it doesn't matter. Was it important? Well, it depends rather on how you look at it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Oh, good morning. My word, I'm surprised to see you here again today. Well, ma'am, I said to myself this morning, if they can take it, I guess I can too. <laughs> hello, Sam. Oh, hello. Oh, you're not windy, are you? Yes. I thought you old chaps got over that. You never get over it. No, there's nothing to it, Sam. It's easy stuff. You're taking Cora out on Tuesday, aren't you? That's right. She tell you. Yeah. Would you do something for me, Frank, if I asked you? Oh, I expect so. What? Tell her you can't go. Why? Never mind. Tell her. I thought you said you weren't interested. I didn't say that. I said we weren't courting. I get you. Well? Well, it's a bit up to her, isn't it? It's up to you, too. I wouldn't like to be rude to a lady, Sam. Of course, if she likes to tell me the dates off, well, that's a different matter. I see. It may mean you and I having a bit of a quarrel, Frank. Oh, we wouldn't quarrel, Sam. You and me, what an idea. Don't do that, do you mind? Clean shirt. Okay, Sammy boy. If that's the way you want it, let battle commence. In half an hour's play this morning, then, England has scored 23 more runs without losing a wicket. So, with England 286, we return you to the studio. Thank heavens. Poor old Sam is having a white prison off, isn't he? That he's twittering up there on that balcony, poor old chap. Well, Sam Palmer. That's right. <laughs> well, of course, he shouldn't be playing at all by right, should he? I mean, look what he's done so far this season. <laughs> he's passed it, there's no doubt about that. I reckon he's got a pal on the selection board, all right. Uh, can I have another gin and tonic, please? Isn't that funny? We're right out of gin. But that bottle up there's nearly full. I said we're right out of gin. Why don't you try the Red Lion? I serve anybody there. Good morning.
Oh, Mr. Palmer, would you like me to get you some ginger beer or something? No, thank you. These notices are wonderful, aren't they? Yes. Uh, did you see what they said about him when he won the Peabody Prize? Oh, yes, yes, I did. The, um, the grand young man of English poetry. Yes, that was quite a long while ago. I say, aren't you ever scared of being his secretary? Scared? Well, I know I would be. I'd be scared to even talk to him at all in case I was interrupting some... some inspiration of his. You've added a new terror to my job. I can assure you it has quite enough terror already. Do you keep a dog? Yes. Oh, just a minute. Hello? Oh, good morning, Mr. Punsonby. I expect you're ringing up about the poem he's working on. What? When did you tell him this? Are you sure, Mr. Punsonby? Because he, he told me this morning that he had to finish it before he left for America. I see. And you're quite sure you don't need it until the Christmas edition. I see. It's just that you wanted him to lunch tomorrow, is it? Oh, well, I happen to know that he can't. He has a date already. Yes. Yes. And thank you so much, Mr. Punsonby. Goodbye. Can you hear voices? Well, I thought I did a moment ago. I can hear them now. What on earth can the brute be up to? And that one went past Gully's left hand. Shut and the it's door. Forrest chasing it out there at third man. I don't think he's going to save the second. No, he won't save it. Alex, no, really? Second. Come oh, I was just me. testing out my television set to see that it's still working properly. Do go away, dear. I've got my poem to write for the new statesman. You know perfectly well you haven't got to finish your poem. Mr. Punson has just rung up and let the cat clean out of the bag. Go away! This is Mr. Palmer. He's been waiting a long time to see you. Oh. <laughs> How do you do? Very nice meeting you. How is, uh, Basingstoke? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I've never been there. How extraordinary. I quite thought you came from Basingstoke. Who do we know, then, who comes from Basingstoke? Uh, quite a different boy called Arkwright. This is Mr. Palmer. He comes from London. Oh, really? How fascinating. Well, now, what can we do for you, Mr. Palmer? Um, uh, my poem. Your poem? Yes. Oh, yes, your poem. Oh, of course, yes. Yes, I've got it. No, I haven't. Oh, well, I must have filed it. Miss Fanshawe, fetch me Mr. Arkwright's poem from the file. Where exactly would the file be in which you put Mr. Palmer's poem? The poetry file, dear, is always kept in the study. <laughs> Dreadful old muddler. <laughs> Have a cigarette. Uh, no, thank you. No, no, of course not. When I read your poem, I liked it very much. I thought it bore uh, traces. Alarms. Oh, thank you. I thought it bore traces of the near... Oh, that's all, all the way. Is that a wicket? No, a boundary. Oh, thank heavens. Hitting about like that all over the field as if this wasn't a test match at all. There are only two wickets down, you know, but we could still lose this match. Two wickets? Dad's not been in then. No. Now, what did you say? I didn't say anything, Mr. Whitehead. Yes, you did. I heard you distinctly. You said Dad. Palmer. Yes. Your Sam Palmer's son. Dear fellow. Oh, my dear fellow, do sit down, please. What must you think of me keeping you waiting like that? It's all that idiotic Fanshawe's fault. Fanshawe? Fanshawe? What on earth do you mean by not telling me who Mr. Palmer was? But I did. You did nothing of the kind. You never said he was Sam Palmer's son. Here we have Mr. Palmer coming all the way down from London. Why have you come down from London? What on earth are you doing here with your father going into bat at any moment at the Oval? I thought... I thought it was more important to see you, Mr. Whitehead. More important to see me? Are you out of your senses? Couldn't your father get you a ticket? Oh, yes, I've got a ticket, all right. You don't mean to say you're going to waste it. Do you realize? Do you realize that I applied over six months ago for a ticket? And if it hadn't been for that idiotic fan for bungling the whole thing, I should be at the Oval now. You wouldn't see me for dust. I didn't bungle it. You were unlucky in the draw, that's all. But it's a very funny thing that Christopher Fry got his ticket. That's all I can say. Very funny indeed, my dear young fellow. You mustn't waste another moment. You must rush back to London at once and pray you'll be in time to see your father. But you couldn't give me a ticket, I suppose. Well, I have got a letter to get me into the pavilion. I know. I'll use that and you can have my seat. Wonderful. Come along. Alex, for heaven's sake. Alex, your letters. Don't talk to me about letters, dear. I've got a ticket for the Oval. Pull that string, will you? Kill yourself. Remember, it's only a game. Philistine! Fool! That's the way some people drive. 
So you want to be a poet, do you? Yes, Mr. Whitehead. More than anything else. Very commendable. Far too little poetry in the world. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Whitehead, do you prefer Keats to Wordsworth? My dear boy, you mustn't expect me to talk about literature when there's a test match on. My brain doesn't function properly. Ask me if I prefer your father to Don Bradman, I'll give you the answer. I've got something to confess to you, Mr. Whitehead. I'm afraid I don't awfully like cricket. Don't you really? I have heard of such people. Excuse me, Mr. Whitehead, but... Uh... Isn't this a built-up area? I should think so. Why don't you like cricket? Well, the fact of the matter is, I, I find it so frightfully dull. Frightfully dull? Well, of course it's frightfully dull. That's the whole point. Any game can be exciting. Football, dirt track racing, roulette. The measure of the vast superiority of cricket over any other game is that it steadfastly refuses to cater to this boorish craving for excitement. To go to cricket to be thrilled is as stupid as to go to a Chekhov play in search of melodrama. Oh, did that policeman shout something? I think he was holding up the traffic, Mr. Whitehead. Oh, how frightfully kind of him. What was I talking about? Um, Chekhov. Oh, yes, Chekhov and cricket. Great similarity, you know. Same sense of shape, of pattern, form, <laughs> design. Each done with that superbly satisfying art which conceals art having the same passion for the beautifully inconclusive. <laughs> your father would know what I was talking about. Great artist, your father. Do you really think he's that, Mr. Whitehead? My dear boy, there were two innings of his that I shall remember till my dying day. One was when Surrey needed runs fast. He made 103 in just under an hour without a single vulgar or bucolic stroke. The other was an occasion at Lord's in a test match. Get out of the way. When in the two hours between lunch and tea, he made with consummate elegance, exactly six runs and broke the Australian's hearts. Oh, a great man, man to be remembered. We must be through the limit now, must we? Well, I think that... Good, we can open up a bit. Oh, good shot, sir, good shot. Row O. Row O. Oh, hey, what's that? Hey. Look here, this seat's taken. It is indeed, madam, by me. You can't come barging in taking any vacant place, you see. You ought to know better. Shh. I will not hush, and I'd still like to know what you're doing in someone else's seat. It's a very long story, madam, and though I should tell it to you quite beautifully, this is not. Ah! Fool! Get back! Get back! Oh! I can't bear it. We must come in now. We can't make him face that last over. Why don't those beastly umpires call the luncheon interval? Well, if that's what you all want, so why don't you shout at the beastly umpires? Shout, shout at, at the umpires? umpires? It's an interesting idea. I must try it sometime. Too late now. Let's hope they send in somebody else. Good luck, Sam. Thanks, George. Best of luck, Sam. Good luck, Sam. No, don't worry. It's a nice, easy place, wicket. Thanks, Dennis. No, it's him, I'm afraid. Excuse me. Here comes Sam Palmer to face these anxious last four balls before lunch, looking as trim and as competent as he did when he first came to test cricket 25 years ago. A bit thicker, perhaps, but just as reliable and as reassuring looking. Looks around the field, plots the fieldsman in that experienced cricket brain of his. And here's his first ball from Linda from the pavilion end. Not out. He's hit him on the pad and appealed for LBW. Not out. But it was a very close thing. That was a very confident appeal. Nevertheless, he gives another tug at that cap of his, pulling it further down over his right ear, as if it needed it, and settles down to this next ball from Linder, who comes in, bowls to him on a length on the leg stump, and he pushes it safely down there to forward short leg. Just two balls to go. 
Here's the first of them, Linda from the pavilion end, bowls to him, and he shoulders arms, lets it go through outside the off stump. And now, the last ball before lunch. Sam Palmer. LBW Linder, not. You can feel the disappointment for him all the way around the ground. That then is England 316 for four and we return you to... But wait, wait, just a moment. Look at this. The entire Australian side is lined up in a corridor down from the wicket and they're cheering Palmer as he walks back to the pavilion. And all the way around the ground, people are standing up cheering. Hutton stands back to let him go up the pavilion steps first. Good old Sam! didn't score. I've never seen a crowd swarm over the ground like this before the end of a match. If he'd made 300 runs, they couldn't have given him a grander reception. And now, although he's gone into the pavilion, the applause is still going on as fiercely as ever. I don't think on, any of us here are ever going to forget the last couple of minutes. Bad luck, Sam. That one kept a bit low. Oh, well. You shouldn't have done that, you know, Skipper, standing back like that. It's you they wanted to see. Is that the way it sounds to you out there, Sam? Someone to see you, Sam. Right. I don't believe you're right, Dad. It didn't look up to me. I was out all right. Sid doesn't make mistakes. Now, Skipper, this is my Reggie. Delighted to meet you. How do you do, sir? Looks like a cricketer, Sam. I know, and pity. Why pity? Well, he's going to be a poet, and he ought to look like a poet. Deceptive appearance, eh? <laughs> Come back five minutes before I start a play, and we'll have a little chat about Tall Man. What about Tall Man? Never you mind. Dad, I've, um, got to ask someone to dinner. Well, your aunt won't like that. Don't give her time to do her shopping. Who? Um, Alexander Whitehead. You don't mean it? Yes. He isn't coming? Yes, he is. What do you mean he liked your poem so much? Oh, he hasn't even read my poem. At least I don't think he has. He, um, he wants to meet you. He must be crackers. Oh, and, um, here's your pound back. I didn't need to use it after all. I beheld today an astonishing spectacle. It was no less than the personal Dunkirk of an aging cricketer. But a crowd of many thousands with the wildest enthusiasm hailed it as his greatest triumph, no less. Oh dear, they're the wrong color. Well, they're the best I could get, Auntie. Well, they had to do, I suppose. Really, Reggie, I do wish we could have had a bit more warning. Oh, he won't mind. He's very bohemian. Bohemian? <laughs> that means caviar and champagne. Auntie, Mr. Hutton told me today that Dad has given up that coaching job because of me. Is that true? Well, he... He did say something about it being a bit awkward with you going to Oxford and everything. I see. We've got to get him to take that job, Auntie. And how, I should like to know. You know what it's like getting your dad to do anything. Mules aren't in it. Well, you and I can manage it together. A conspiracy, Auntie. <laughs> Probably unlike that little conspiracy of ours last night, eh? <laughs> do help me, Auntie, will you? All right. It's very important to me, you know. It's important to my amour propre. And what's that when it's at home? Do me up, Ethel, will you? Nasty thing. 
All right, dear, don't get so overexcited. You'll choke yourself. Of all the evenings to invite a ruddy poet to supper. Well, that's what I've been telling him. Now, look, Reg, if I get a bit stammery and get myself into a sentence and don't know how the blazes to get out of it, and that's very likely, mind you, you chip in quickly, you understand? Rescue work is what I want from you tonight. And anyway, I expect you to do 90% of the talking. You and Ethel. Oh, Lord, here we go. Haven't done this blooming tie yet. Well, I never, if it isn't you again. What are you doing? Are you following me about? No, no. This is Balmoral, isn't it? Of course it's Balmoral. Now, you be off or I'll call the police. But I've been invited. Oh. Oh, it isn't. It couldn't be. Mr. Whitehead. Oh, do come in, please. How dreadful. Whatever must you think of me? I'd no idea. Oh, well, you're dressed. Will the great man be dressed, too? Do you mean my brother? Well, hello, Mr. Whitehead. You wretched boy, why didn't you warn me? Look what I'm wearing. Oh, please, Mr. Whitehead, don't you worry one bit. My brother and I often slip into something loose for dinner. It makes us feel more relaxed, you know. Now, would you just excuse me while I nip into the kitchen, because it's our maid's night out, see? Now, Reggie, you look after Mr. Whitehead, dear. In here, Mr. Whitehead. Shh, still. Can I, can I get you a glass of sherry or something? No, thank you. A cigarette, Mr. Whitehead. No, thank you. Reggie, it's quite on the cards. I'm going to make an embarrassing spectacle of myself tonight. I'm absolutely paralyzed with nerves. I once met Jack Hobbs, you know, and for ten minutes I could do nothing but make incoherent clicking noises, which luckily he took to be my observations on the weather. If anything like that should happen tonight, I want you to help me out. <clears throat> oh, uh, uh, this is my father. Um, Dad, uh, Mr. Alexander Whitehead. How are you? Bad luck it raining this afternoon, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, very bad luck. Yeah. Of course, there, there, there wouldn't have been a finish to the game anyway, would there? Well, I suppose not. Oh, pardon me, Mr. Whitehead. Reg, would you come and help me, please, dear? Oh, all right, Auntie. Excuse me. We, uh, we saw a play of yours last night on television. Did you? Yes, quite remarkable, I thought. Did you indeed? Quite remarkable. I saw you bat this morning. Did you? Bad luck you're getting out like that. Oh, I don't know. Tell me, Mr. Palmer, did the ball go with his arm? Well, Mr. Whitehead, quite frankly, that's the sort of thing we say in the pavilion afterwards. Between you and me, it didn't do a blooming thing. It was straight and I missed it, that's all. Oh, that's wonderful. That's exactly what I thought you'd say. You see, I think I ought to tell you, Mr. Palmer, You've been a hero of mine ever since I was at school. Really? Yes. And this morning, when you were out like that and the crowd stood for you, well, I, I blubbed, <laughs> just as if I was at school again. Well, I never. At the same time, I don't mind telling you I envied you a bit. Envied me? Your choice of professions. You see, others aren't quite so rewarding. Well, take my own, for instance. I mean, when the time comes for me to retire and I write my last play, if I'm bold for a duck on the first night, I don't quite see the audience standing and cheering me for five minutes. Yes, but your profession, well, I mean, it is a profession. After all, what you do lasts. What I do, or what I have done, rather, well, there's nothing to show. Nothing to show, but you're out of your mind. I beg your pardon, Mr. Palmer. It's just I always get so excited about this. You see, it's the old argument of the non-creative artist being forgotten, while the creative artist lives on. Well, am I a, what was it, a non-creative artist? Of course you are, but now tell me, Mr. Palmer, do you think Paganini's forgotten? Is Pavlova? Is Nijinsky, is Garrick, of course they're not. The non-creative artist has it over the creative artist all the time. Because what he's done or has done must go on getting better and better as the years go by until a legend of greatness is built up which goes far beyond the actual truth. Do you think Paganini was as good as all that? Of course he wasn't. It's just that his legend has grown up with the years, just as your legend will grow up until in 50 years' time you'll be enthroned on Olympus between Don Bradman and W.G. There won't be any legend about me, Mr. Palmer, because I've left a record behind for posterity to read and probably sneer at. They can't sneer at you, Mr. Palmer. That's why I envy you so deeply. Well, I can't say that I've understood everything you've said, Mr. Whitehead, and one or two of those names you mentioned just now, I, I have to confess I wasn't too sure of myself. Still, coming from a man like you, that's quite a comfort. Quite a comfort. Because I, I don't mind telling you, I've been worrying a bit lately, and this damn collar's too tight. Take it off. I think I will. 
Mr. Palmer, I want to ask you something really important. Do you hold your hand further over for the hook? Oh, no. Never move your hands for any stroke. Now, look, I'll show you. Now, this is my grip. I suppose it isn't what you call classical, but still it works. Now, for a hook, I put my foot across and hit into it, like that. I wonder if I might try that while it's still fresh in my mind. Yes, do. Now, then, get the grip right. That's right. Thumb over. That's right. Now, foot across and... Oh, that's not bad. Now, try again. Now, thumb over. Get that grip right. That's right. Now, foot and now hit right into it. <laughs> I'm frightfully sorry. Oh, that's all right. Never mind. I always hated it. Now, I don't think you got that quite right. Just let me show you that again. Dinner's quite ready. Oh. My best Chinese bars. Sam Palmer, how could you? I'm afraid I did it. Oh? Oh, well, Mr. Whitehead, it doesn't matter a bit, really. Where's your collar? I took it off. It's more comfortable. Well, shall we go in? I still don't see how you get any force into the stroke without changing the grip. Well, it's all a question of timing. Excuse me? You mean like this? Oh, that's all right, Mr. Whitehead. Now, watch my hand. Oh, hello, Cora, dear. Could I see Sam a moment, please, Miss Palmer? Well, dear, he's just at dinner, and uh, we've got rather an important guest. Well, I, I only want a word. Just one word. All right, dear. I'll tell him. Sam, it's Cora. Can you see her for a minute, dear? Hello, Cora. I don't want to interrupt you, Sam. I just wanted to ask you if you were coming to the stag as usual tonight. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got a guest. Well, tomorrow then? I don't know, Cora. I'm not sure that I like the idea of standing at a bar, gooping away when I'm not wanted. Who says you're not wanted? You did last night. I didn't. I said it's all you ever did, that's all. I never said I didn't want you to do it. Oh. Well, that's all I have to say, except... I was sorry about your innings, Sam. I don't mind telling you, when you got out, I was that cut up, I cried. Seems to be a lot of crying around here this morning. Running Niagara all over the country. The chap on the wireless said that it was the same as if you'd made 300. Well, I want you to know, Sam, that's the way I felt about it. Only you didn't need 300. Only 240. You remember? You said that you doubled his 120. Cora, what you said about me last night, that's all right. It's what you said about yourself that's been worrying me. What was that? Well, you said, oh, you implied, well, perhaps you mightn't always have been all you should have been. You don't know an awful lot about things, do you, Sam? Well, I promise you that in that respect, I'm no better and no worse than 99% of the rest of the old human race. Oh, don't quibble, Cora. Would you like to swear to me this very minute that there's never been anybody else? Well, I, I don't know if you've got the right, Sam. Oh, go on. Yes or no? Which is it? No. You swear? Swear. Oh, my goodness. Mr. Palmer, I've got it. I really believe I've got it. It's Cora, isn't it? How are you, Cora, my love? I'm very well, thank you, Mr. Whitehead, dear. Are you staying for dinner? I do hope so. If so, my cup of bliss will be full. No, I'm afraid not, Mr. Whitehead. I have to get back to the stag. Oh, what a shame. Now, look, Mr. Palmer, if I hold my hand do like you that... you mind going back in the dining room, Mr. Whitehead? My sister will be getting a bit fussed. I'm just coming in, and I'll show you in a minute. Do you know Mr. Whitehead? Yes, he used to come into the Green Man at Chelsea quite a bit. How well do you know him? Sam Palmer. Auntie says you're to come because... Because the... The soup? Oh, Reggie. <laughs> well, there it is, Reg, for better or for worse. What do you think? For better. Good night, Sam. I'll see you at closing time to help you with the washing up. It's been quite a day, hasn't it? <clears throat> it certainly has. Dad, I... 
awfully sorry about the things I said this morning. It's all right. Can't help the things we feel, can we? Yes, Dad, but... You know, I... I'm not so sure I do feel them anymore. <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing, Reg. When Sid Thompson lifted his finger this morning, I thought to myself, this is it, Sam Palmer. This is the finish. Well, you know, I'm just wondering if it wasn't really the beginning. Oh, I am most awfully sorry. <laughs> oh, yes, you <laughs>